Chapter Seven of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. With the cool air and firmly packed sand underfoot, walking should have been easy. Leah spoiled that. The concussion seemed to have temporarily cut off the reasoning part of her brain, leaving a direct connection to her vocal cords. As she stumbled along, only half-conscious, she mumbled all of her darkest fears that were better left unvoiced. Occasionally there was relevancy in her complaints. They would lose their way, never find the city, die of thirst, freezing, heat, or hunger. Interspersed and entwined with these were fears from her past that still floated submerged in the timeless ocean of her subconscious. Some Brian could understand, though he tried not to listen. Fears of losing credits, not getting the highest grade, falling behind, a woman alone in a world of men, leaving school, being lost, trampled among the nameless hordes that struggle for survival in the crowded city-states of Earth. There were other things she was afraid of that made no sense to a man of Anvar. Who were the Alkians that seemed to trouble her? Or what was Canceri, Cancery, Dadal and Hadal? Who was Manston, whose name kept coming up over and over each time accompanied by a little moan? Brian stopped and picked her up in both arms. With a sigh, she settled against the hard width of his chest and was instantly asleep. Even with the additional weight, he made better time now, and he stretched to his fastest kilometer-consuming stride to make good use of these best hours. Somewhere, on a stretch of gravel and shelving rock, he lost the track of the sand car. He wasted no time looking for it. By carefully watching the glistening stars rise and set, he had made a good estimate of the geographic north. Dis didn't seem to have a pole star. However, a box-like constellation turned slowly around the invisible point of the pole. Keeping this positioned in line with his right shoulder guided him on the westerly course he needed. When his arms began to grow tired, he lowered Leah gently to the ground. She didn't wake. Stretching for an instant before taking up his burden again, Brian was struck by the terrible loneliness of the desert. His breath made a vanishing mist against the stars. All else was darkness and silence. How distant he was from his home, his people, his planet. Even the constellations of the night sky were different. He was used to solitude. But this was a loneliness that touched some deep-buried instinct. A shiver that wasn't from the desert cold touched lightly along his spine, prickling at the hairs of his neck. It was time to go on. He shrugged the disquieting sensations off and carefully tied Leah into the jacket he had been wearing. Slung like a pack on his back, it made the walking easier. The gravel gave way to sliding dunes of sand that seemed to continue to infinity. It was a painful, slipping climb to the top of each one, then an equally difficult descent to the black-pooled hollow at the foot of the next. With the first lightning of the sky in the east, he stopped, breath rasping in his chest, to mark his direction before the stars faded. One line scratched in the sand pointed due north. A second pointed out the course they should follow. When they were aligned to his satisfaction, he washed his mouth out with a single swallow of water and sat on the sand next to the still form of the girl. Gold fingers of fire searched across the sky, wiping out the stars. It was magnificent. Brian forgot his fatigue and appreciation. There should be some way of preserving it. A quatrain would be best, short enough to be remembered, yet requiring attention and skill to compact everything into it. He had scored high with his quatrains in the twenties. This would be a special one. Tained, his poetry mentor, would have to get a copy. What are you mumbling about? 
Leah asked, looking up at the craggy blackness of his profile against the reddening sky. Poem, he said. Shh, just a minute. It was too much for Leah, coming after the tension and dangers of the night. She began to laugh, laughing even harder when he scowled at her. Only when she heard the tinge of growing hysteria did she make an attempt to break off the laughter. The sun cleared the horizon, washing a sudden warmth over them. Leah gasped. Your throat's been cut. You're bleeding to death. Not really, he said, touching his fingertips lightly against the blood-clotted wound that circled his neck. Just superficial. Depression sat on him as, as he suddenly remembered the battle and death of the previous night. Leah didn't notice his face. She was busy digging in the pack he had thrown down. He had to use his fingers to massage and force away the grimace of pain that twisted his mouth. Memory was more painful than the wound. How easily he had killed three men. How close to the surface of the civilized man the animal dwelled. In countless matches he had used those holes, always drawing back from the exertion of the full killing power. They were part of the game, part of the twenties. Yet, when his friend had been killed, he had become a killer himself. He believed in nonviolence and the sanctity of life, until the first test, when he had killed without hesitation. More ironic was the fact he really felt no guilt even now. Shock at the change, yes, but no more than that. Lift your chin. Leah said, brandishing the antiseptic applicator she had found in the medicine kit. He lifted his chin obligingly, and the liquid drew a cool, burning line across his neck. Antibiopills would do a lot more good since the wound was completely clotted by now, but he didn't speak his thoughts aloud. For the moment, Leah had forgotten herself in taking care of him. He put some of the antiseptics on her scalp bruise, and she squeaked, pulling back. They both swallowed the pills. The sun is hot already, Leah said, peeling off her heavy clothing. Let's find a nice cool cave or an air-conditioned saloon to crawl into for the day. I don't think there are any here. Just sand. We have to walk. I know we have to walk, she interrupted. There's no need for a lecture about it. You're as seriously cubical as the Bank of Terra. Relax. Count ten and start again. Leah was making empty talk while she listened to the memory of hysteria tittering at the fringes of her brain. No time for that. We have to keep going. Brian climbed slowly to his feet after stowing everything in the pack. When he sighted along his marker at the western horizon, he saw nothing to mark their course, only the marching dunes. He helped Leah to her feet and began walking slowly toward them. Just hold on a second, Leah called after him. Where do you think you're going? In that direction, he said, pointing. I hoped there would be some landmarks, but there aren't. We'll have to keep on by dead reckoning. The sun will keep us pretty well on course. If we aren't there by night, the stars will be a better guide. All this on an empty stomach? How about breakfast? I'm hungry and thirsty. No food. He shook the canteen that gurgled emptily. It had been only partly filled when he found it. The water's low, and we'll need it later. I need it now, she said shortly. My mouth tastes like an unemptied ashtray, and I'm dry as paper. Just a single swallow, he said after the briefest hesitation. This is all we have. Leah sipped at it with her eyes closed in appreciation. Then he sealed the top and returned it to the pack without taking any himself. They were sweating as they started up the first dune. The desert was barren of life. They were the only things moving under that merciless sun. Their shadows pointed the way ahead of them, and as the shadows shortened, the heat rose. 
it had an intensity Leah had never experienced before. A physical weight that pushed at her with a searing hand. Her clothing was sodden with perspiration, and it trickled burning into her eyes. The light and heat made it hard to see, and she leaned on the immovable strength of Brian's arm. He walked on steadily, apparently ignoring the heat and discomfort. "'I wonder if those things are edible, or store water.' Brian's voice was a harsh rasp. Leah blinked and squinted at the leathery shape on the summit of the dune. Plant or animal, it was hard to tell. It was the size of a man's head, wrinkled and gray as dried-out leather, knobbed with thick spikes. Brian pushed it up with his toe, and they had a brief glimpse of a white roundness, like a shiny taproot, going down into the dune. Then the thing contracted, pulling itself lower into the sand. At the same instant, something thin and sharp lashed out through a fold in the skin, striking at Brian's boot and withdrawing. There was a scratch on the hard plastic, beaded with drops of green liquid. Probably poison, he said, digging his toe into the sand. This thing's too mean to fool with, without a good reason. Let's keep going. It was noon before Leah fell down. She really wanted to go on, but her body wouldn't obey. The thin soles of her shoes were no protection against the burning sand, and her feet were lumps of raw pain. Heat hammered down, poured up from the sand, and swirled her in an oven of pain. The air she gasped in was molten metal that dried and cracked her mouth. Each pulse of her heart throbbed blood to the wound in her scalp, until it seemed her skull would burst with the agony. She had stripped down to the short tunic, in spite of Brian's insistence that she keep her body protected from the sun, and that clung to her, soaked with sweat. She tore at it in a desperate effort to breathe. There was no escape from the unending heat. Though the baked sand burned torture into her knees and hands, she couldn't rise. It took all her strength not to fall further. Her eyes closed, and everything swirled in immense circles. Brian, blinking through slitted eyes, saw her go down. He lifted her and carried her again as he had the night before. The hot touch of her body shocked his bare arms. Her skin was flushed pink. The tunic was torn open, and one pointed breast rose and fell unevenly with the irregularity of her breathing. Wiping his palm free of sweat and sand, he touched her skin and felt the ominous hot dryness. Heat shock, all the symptoms. Dry, flushed skin, the ragged breathing, her temperature rising quickly as her body stopped fighting the heat and succumbed. There was nothing he could do here to protect her from the heat. He measured a tiny portion of the remaining water into her mouth, and she swallowed convulsively. Her thin clothing was little protection from the sun. He could only take her in his arms and keep on towards the horizon. An outcropping of rock threw a tiny patch of shade, and he walked towards it. The ground here, shielded from the direct rays of the sun, felt almost cool by contrast. Leah opened her eyes when he put her down, peering up at him through a haze of pain. She wanted to apologize to him for her weakness, but no words came from the dried membrane of her throat. His body above her seemed to swim back and forth in the heat waves, swaying like a tree in a high wind. Shock drove her eyes open, cleared her mind for an instant. He really was swaying. Suddenly she realized how much she had come to depend on the unending solidity of his strength, and now it was failing. All over his body the corded muscles contracted in ridges, striving to keep him erect. She saw his mouth pulled open by the taut cords of his neck, and the gaping, silent scream was more terrible than any sound. 
Then she herself screamed as his eyes rolled back, leaving only the empty white of the eyeballs staring terribly at her. He went over, back, down like a felled tree, thudding heavily on the sand. Unconscious or dead, she couldn't tell. She pulled limply at his leg, but couldn't drag his immense weight into the shade. Brian lay on his back in the sun, sweating. Leah saw this and knew that he was still alive. Yet, what was happening? She groped for memory in the red haze of her mind, but could remember nothing from her medical studies that would explain this. On every square inch of his body, the sweat glands seethed with sudden activity. From every pore oozed great globules of oily liquid far thicker than normal perspiration. Brian's arms rippled with motion, and Leah gaped, horrified, as the hairs there writhed and stirred as though endowed with separate life. His chest rose and fell rapidly. Deep, gasping breaths racked his body. Leah could only stare through the dim redness of unreality and wonder if she were going mad before she died. A coughing fit broke the rhythm of his rasping breath, and when it was over, his breathing was easier. The perspiration still covered his body, the individual beads touching and forming tiny streams that trickled down his body and vanished in the sand. He stirred and rolled onto his side, facing her. His eyes were open and normal now as he smiled. "'Didn't mean to frighten you. It caught me suddenly, coming at the wrong season and everything. It was a bit of a jar to my system. I'll get you some water now. There's still a bit left.' "'What happened? When you looked like that, when you fell—' "'Take two swallows, no more,' he said, holding the open canteen to her mouth. "'Just summer change, that's all.' It happens to us every year on Anvar, only not that violently, of course. In the winter our bodies store a layer of fat under the skin for insulation, and sweating almost ceases completely. There are a lot of internal changes, too. When the weather warms up, the process is reversed. The fat is metabolized, and the sweat glands enlarge and begin working overtime as the body prepares for two months of hard work, heat, and little sleep. I guess the heat here triggered off the summer change early. You mean you've adapted to this terrible planet? Just about, though it does feel a little warm. I'll need a lot more water soon, so we can't remain here. Do you think you can stand the sun if I carry you? No, but I won't feel any better staying here. She was light-headed, scarcely aware of what she said. Keep going, I guess. Keep going. As soon as she was out of the shadow of the rock, the sunlight burst over her again in a wave of hot pain. She fell unconscious at once. Brian picked her up and staggered forward. After a few yards, he began to feel the pull of the sand. He knew he was reaching the end of his strength. He went more slowly, and each dune seemed a bit higher than the one before. Giant, sand-scoured rocks pushed through the dunes here, and he had to stumble around them. At the base of the largest of these monoliths was a straggling clump of knotted vegetation. He passed it by, then stopped as something tried to penetrate his heat-crazed mind. What was it? A difference, something about these plants that he hadn't noticed in any of the others he had passed during the day. It was almost like defeat to turn and push his clumsy feet backwards in his own footsteps, to stand blinking helplessly at the plants. Yet they were important. Some of them had been cut off close to the sand, not broken by any natural cause, but cut sharply and squarely by a knife or a blade of some sort. The cut plants were long dried and dead, but a tiny hope flared up in him. This was the first sign that other people were actually alive on this heat-blasted planet. And whatever the plants had been cut for, they might be of aid to him. Food, perhaps drink. His hands trembled at the thought, 
as he dropped Leah heavily into the shade of the rock. She didn't stir. His knife was sharp, but most of the strength was gone from his hands. Breath rasping in his dry throat, he sawed at the tough stem, finally cutting it through. Raising up the shrub, he saw a thick liquid dripping from the severed end. He braced his hand against his leg so it wouldn't shake and spill until his cupped palm was full of sap. It was wet, even a little cool as it evaporated. Surely it was mostly life-giving water. He had a moment's misgiving as he raised it to his lips, and instead of drinking it, merely touched it with the tip of his tongue. At first, nothing. Then, a searing pain. It stabbed deep into his throat and choked him. His stomach heaved and he vomited bitter bile. On his knees, fighting the waves of pain, he lost body fluid he vitally needed. Despair was worse than the pain. The plant juice must have some use. There must be some way of purifying it or neutralizing it. But Brian, a stranger on this planet, would be dead long before he found out how to do this. Weakened by the cramps that still tore at him, he tried not to realize how close to the end he was. Getting the girl on his back seemed an impossible task, and for an instant he was tempted to leave her there. Yet even as he considered this, he shouldered her leaden weight, and once more went on. Each footstep and effort, he followed his own track up the dune. Painfully he forced his way to the top, and looked at the Disson standing a few feet away. They were both too surprised by the sudden encounter to react at once. For a breath of time they stared at each other, unmoving. When they reacted, it was the same defense of fear. Brian dropped the girl, bringing the gun up from the holster in the return of the same motion. The Disson jerked a belled tube from his waistband and raised it to his mouth. Brian didn't fire. A dead man had taught him how to train his empathic sense and to trust it. In spite of the fear that wanted him to jerk the trigger, a different sense read the unvoiced emotions of the native Disson. There was fear there, and hatred. Welling up around these was a strong desire not to commit violence, this time to communicate instead. Brian felt and recognized all this in a fraction of a second. He had to act instantly to avoid a tragic happening. A jerk of his wrist threw the gun to one side. As soon as it was gone, he regretted its loss. He was gambling their lives on an ability he still was not sure of. The Disson had the tube to his mouth when the gun hit the ground. He held the pose, unmoving, thinking. Then he accepted Brian's action and thrust the tube back into his waistband. "'Do you have any water?' Brian asked, the guttural Disson words hurting his throat. "'I have water.' the man said. He still didn't move. Who are you? What are you doing here? We're from off-planet. We had an accident. We want to go to the city. The water. The Disson looked at the unconscious girl and made his decision. Over one shoulder he wore one of the green objects that Brian remembered from the Solido. He pulled it off, and the thing writhed slowly in his hands. It was alive. A green length a meter long, like a noduled section of a thick vine. One end flared out into a petal-like formation. The Disson took a hook-shaped object from his waist and thrust it into the petaled orifice. When he turned the hook in a quick motion, the length of green writhed and curled around his arm. He pulled something small and dark out and threw it to the ground, extending the twisting green shape towards Brian. Put your mouth to the end and drink, he said. Leah needed the water more, but
but he drank first, suspicious of the living water source. A hollow below the writhing petals was filling with straw-colored water from the fibrous reedy interior. He raised it to his mouth and drank. The water was hot and tasted swampy. Sudden sharp pains around his mouth made him jerk the thing away. Tiny, glistening white barbs projected from the petals, pink-tipped now with his blood. Brian swung toward the disson angrily and stopped when he looked at the other man's face. His mouth was surrounded by many small white scars. The Vede does not like to give up its water, but it always does, the man said. Brian drank again, then put the Vede to Leah's mouth. She moaned without regaining consciousness, her lips seeking reflexively for the life-saving liquid. When she was satisfied, Brian gently drew the barbs from her flesh and drank again. The Disson hunkered down on his heels and watched them expressionlessly. Brian handed back the Vede, then held some of the clothes so that Leah was in their shade. He settled to the same position as the native and looked closely at him. Squatting, immobile on his heels, the Disson appeared perfectly comfortable under the flaming sun. There was no trace of perspiration on his naked brown skin. Long hair fell to his shoulders, and startlingly blue eyes stared back at Brian from deepest sockets. The heavy kilt around his loins was the only garment he wore. Once more the Vede rested over his shoulder, still stirring unhappily. Around his waist was the same collection of leather, stone, and brass objects that had been in the Solido. Two of them now had meaning to Brian. The tube and mouthpiece, a blowgun of some kind, and the specially shaped hook for opening the Vede. He wondered if the other strangely formed things had equally practical functions. If you accepted them as artifacts with a purpose, not barbaric decorations, you had to accept their owner as something more than the crew's savage he resembled. My name is Brian, and you... You may not have my name. Why are you here? To kill my people? Brian forced away the memory of last night. Killing was just what he had done. Some expectancy in the man's manner, some sensed feeling of hope, prompted Brian to speak the truth. I'm here to stop your people from being killed. I believe in the end of the war. Prove it. Take me to the Cultural Relationships Foundation in the city and I'll prove it. I can do nothing here in the desert except die. For the first time, there was emotion in the Disson's face. He frowned and muttered something to himself. There was a fine beating of sweat above his eyebrows now as he fought an internal battle. Coming to a decision, he rose, and Brian stood too. Come with me. I'll take you to Hovestad. But first, you must tell me, are you from Nijard? No. The nameless Disson merely grunted and turned away. Brian shouldered Leah's unconscious body and followed him. They walked for two hours, the Disson setting a cruel pace before they reached a wasteland of jumbled rock. The native pointed to the highest tower of sand-eroded stone. Wait near this, he said. Someone will come for you. He watched while Brian placed the girl's still body in the shade and passed over the Vede for the last time. Just before leaving, he turned back, hesitating. My name is Ulv, he said. Then he was gone. Brian did what he could to make Leah comfortable, but it was very little. If she didn't get medical attention soon, she would be dead. Dehydration and shock were uniting to destroy her. Just before sunset, he heard clanking and the throbbing whine of a sand car's engine coming from the west. 
End of chapter 7「Eight of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight With each second, the noise grew louder coming their way. The tracks squeaked as the car turned around the rock spire, obviously seeking them out. A large carrier, big as a truck, it stopped before them in a cloud of its own dust, and the driver kicked the door open. Get in here and fast, the man shouted. You're letting in all the heat. He gunned the engine, ready to kick in the gears, and looked at them irritatedly. Ignoring the driver's nervous instructions, Brian carefully placed Leah on the back seat before he pulled the door shut. The car surged forward instantly, a blast of icy air pouring from the air-cooling vents. It wasn't cold in the vehicle, but the temperature was at least forty degrees lower than the outer air. Brian covered Leah with all their extra clothing to prevent any further shock to her system. The driver, hunched over the wheel and driving with an intense speed, hadn't said a word to them since they had entered. Brian looked up as another man stepped from the engine compartment to the rear of the car. He was thin, harried-looking and he was pointing a gun. "'Who are you?' he said, without a trace of warmth in his voice. It was a strange reception, but Brian was beginning to realize that Dis was a strange planet. The other man chewed at his lip nervously, while Brian sat relaxed and unmoving. He didn't want to startle him into pulling the trigger, and he kept his voice pitched low as he answered. My name is Brand. We landed from space two nights ago and have been walking in the desert ever since. Now don't get excited and shoot the gun when I tell you this. But both Vion and Igel are dead. The man with the gun gasped. His eyes widened. The driver threw a single frightened look over his shoulder, then turned quickly back to the wheel. Bryant's probe had hit its mark. If these men weren't from the Cultural Relationships Foundation, they at least knew a lot about it. It seemed safe to assume they were CRF men. When they were shot, the girl and I escaped. We were trying to reach the city and contact you. You are from the Foundation, aren't you? Yes, of course, the man said, lowering the gun. He stared glassy-eyed into space for a moment nervously working his teeth against his lip. Startled at his own inattention, he raised the gun again. If you are, Brand, there's something I want to know. Rummaging in his breast pocket with his free hand, he brought out a yellow message form. He moved his lips as he reread the message. Now answer me, if you can. What are the last three events in the... He took a quick look at the paper again. In the twenties. Chess finals, rifle prone position, and fencing playoffs. Why? The man grunted and slid the pistol back into its holder, satisfied. I'm Fossil, he said, and waved the message at Brian. This is Igel's last will and testament, relayed to us by the Nijord blockade control. He thought he was going to die, and he sure was right. Passed on his job to you. You're in charge. I was Merv's second-in-command until he was poisoned. I was supposed to work for Igel, and now I guess I'm yours. At least until tomorrow, when we'll have everything packed and get off this hell planet. What do you mean tomorrow? Brian asked. It's three days to deadline, and we still have a job to do. Fossil had dropped heavily into one of the seats, and he sprang to his feet again, clutching the seat back to keep his balance in the swaying car. Three days, three weeks, three minutes. What difference does it make? His voice rose shrilly with each word, and he had to make a definite effort to master himself before he could go on. Look, you don't know anything about this. You just arrived, and that's your bad luck. My bad luck is being assigned to this death trap and watching the depraved and filthy things the natives do. 
and trying to be polite to them even when they are killing my friends and those nigard bombers up there with their hands on the triggers one of those bombardiers is going to start thinking about home and about the cobalt bombs down here and he's going to press that button deadline or no deadline sit down fossil sit down and take a rest there was sympathy in brian's voice but also the firmness of an order fossil swayed for a second longer then collapsed he sat with his cheek against the window eyes closed a pulse throbbed visibly in his temple and his lips worked he had been under too much tension for too long a time this was the atmosphere that hung heavily in the air at the crf building when they arrived despair and defeat the doctor was the only one who didn't share this mood as he bustled leah off to the clinic with prompt efficiency he obviously had enough patience to keep his mind occupied with the others the feeling of depression was unmistakable from the instant they had driven through the automatic garage door brian had swum in this miasma of defeat it was omnipresent and hard to ignore as soon as he had eaten he went with fossil into what was to have been igel's office through the transparent walls he could see the staff packing the records crating them for shipment fossil seemed less nervous now that he was no longer in command brian rejected any idea he had of letting the man know that he himself was only a novice in the foundation he was going to need all the authority he could muster since they would undoubtedly hate him for what he was going to do better take notes of this fossil and have it typed i'll sign it the printed word always carried more weight all preparations for leaving are to be stopped at once records are to be returned to the files we are going to stay here just as long as we have clearance from the night orders if this operation is unsuccessful we will all leave together when the time expires we will take whatever personal baggage we can carry by hand everything else stays here perhaps you don't realize we are here to save a planet not file cabinets full of papers out of the corner of his eye he saw fossil flush with anger as soon as that is typed bring it back and all the reports as to what has been accomplished on this project that will be all for now fossil stamped out and a minute later brian saw the shocked angry looks from the workers in the outer office turning his back to them he opened the drawers in the desk one after another the top drawer was empty except for a sealed envelope it was addressed to winner igel brian looked at it thoughtfully then ripped it open the letter inside was handwritten igel i've had the official word that you are on the way to relieve me and i am forced to admit i feel only an intense satisfaction you've had the experience on these outlaw planets and can get along with the odd types i have been specializing in research for the last twenty years and the only reason i was appointed planetary supervisor on nigeord was because of the observation and application facilities i'm the research type not the office type no one has ever denied that you're going to have trouble with the staff so you had better realize that they are all compulsory volunteers half are clerical people from my staff the others a mixed bag of whoever was close enough to be pulled in on this crash assignment it developed so fast we never saw it coming and i'm afraid we've done little or nothing to stop it we can't get access to the natives here not in the slightest it's frightening they don't fit I've done the poison distributions on a dozen different factors and none of them can be equated the Perito extrapolations don't work our field men can't even talk to the natives and two have been killed trying the ruling class is unapproachable and the rest just keep their mouths shut and walk away I'm going to take a chance and try to talk to Lig Magti 
Perhaps I can make him see sense. I doubt if it will work, and there is a chance he will try violence with me. The nobility here are very prone to violence. If I get back all right, you won't see this note. Otherwise, goodbye, Igel. Try to do a better job than I did. Aston Merv P.S. There is a problem with the staff. They're supposed to be saviors, but without exception, they all loathe the Dissons. I'm afraid I do, too. Brian ticked off the relevant points in the letter. He had to find some way of discovering what Pareto extrapolations were, without uncovering his own lack of knowledge. The staff would vanish in five minutes if they knew how new he was to the job. Poison distribution made more sense. It was used in physics as the unchanging probability of an event that would be true at all times, such as the numbers of particles that would be given off by a lump of radioactive matter during a short period. From the way Merv used it in his letter, it looked as if the societics people had found measurable applications in societies and groups, at least on other planets. None of the rules seemed to be working on Dis. Igel had admitted that, and Merv's death had proven it. Brian wondered who this Lig Magti was who appeared to have killed Merv. A forged cough broke through Brian's concentration, and he realized that Fossil had been standing in front of his desk for some minutes. Brian looked up and mopped perspiration from his face. "'Your air conditioner seems to be out of order,' Fossil said. "'Should I have the mechanic look at it?' "'There's nothing wrong with the machine. I'm just adapting to Dis's climate. What else do you want, Fossil?' The assistant had a doubting look that he didn't succeed in hiding. He also had trouble believing in literal truth. He placed the small stack of file folders on the desk. These are the reports to date, everything we have uncovered about the Dissons. It's not very much, but considering the antisocial attitudes on this lousy world, it is the best we could do. A sudden thought hit him, and his eyes narrowed slyly. It can't be helped, but some of the staff have been wondering out loud about that native that contacted us. How did you get him to help you? We've never gotten to first base with these people, and as soon as you land, you have one working for you. You can't stop people from thinking about it, you being a newcomer and a stranger. After all, it looks a little odd. He broke off in mid-sentence, as Brian looked at him in cold fury. I can't stop people from thinking about it, but I can stop them from talking. Our job is to contact the Dissons and stop this suicidal war. I've done more in one day than you all have done since you arrived. I've accomplished this because I am better at my work than the rest of you. That is all the information any of you are going to receive. You are dismissed. White with anger, Fossil turned on his heel and stamped out. To spread the word about what a slave driver the new director was. They would then all hate him passionately, which was just the way he wanted it. He couldn't risk exposure as the trio he was. And perhaps a new emotion, other than disgust and defeat, might jar them into a little action. They certainly couldn't do any worse than they had been doing. It was a tremendous amount of responsibility. For the first time since setting foot on this barbaric planet, Brian had time to stop and think. He was taking an awful lot upon himself. He knew nothing about this world, nor about the powers involved in the conflict. Here he sat, pretending to be in charge of an organization he had first heard about only a few weeks earlier. It was a frightening situation. Should he slide out from under? There was just one possible answer, and that was no. Until he found someone else who could do better, he seemed to be the best suited for the job. And Igel's opinion had to count for something. Brian had felt the surety of the man's conviction that Brian was the only one who might possibly succeed in this difficult spot. 
let it go at that if he had any qualms it would be best to put them behind him aside from everything else there was a primary bit of loyalty involved Igel had been an Anvarian and a winner. Maybe it was a provincial attitude to hold in this big universe. Anvar was certainly far enough away from here. But honor is very important to a man who must stand alone. He had a debt to Igel, and he was going to pay it off. Once the decision had been made, he felt easier. There was an intercom on the desk in front of him, and he leaned with a heavy thumb on the button labeled Fossil. Yes? Even through the speaker, the man's voice was cold with ill-concealed hatred. Who is Lig Magti? And did the former director ever return from seeing him? Magti is a title that means roughly noble or lord. Lig Magti is the local overlord. He has an ugly stone heap of a building just outside the city. He seems to be the mouthpiece for the group of Magter that are pushing this idiotic war. As to your second question, I have to answer yes and no. We found Director Merv's head outside the door next morning, with all the skin gone. We knew who it was because the doctor identified the bridge work in his mouth. Do you understand? All pretense of control had vanished, and Fossil had almost shrieked the last words. They were all close to cracking up, if he was any example. Brian broke in quickly. That will be all, Fossil. Just get word to the doctor that I would like to see him as soon as I can. He broke the connection and opened the first of the folders. By the time the doctor called, he had skimmed the reports and was reading the relevant ones in greater detail. Putting on his warm coat, he went through the outer office. The few workers, still on duty, turned their backs in frigid silence. Dr. Stein had a pink and shiny bald head that rose above a thick black beard. Brian liked him at once. Anyone with enough firmness of mind to keep a beard in this climate was a pleasant exception after what he had met so far. How's the new patient, doctor? Stein combed his beard with stubby fingers before answering. Diagnosis, heat syncope. Prognosis, complete recovery. Condition fair, considering the dehydration and extensive sunburn. I've treated the burns, and a saline drop is taking care of the other. She just missed going into heat shock. I have her under sedation now. I'd like to have her up and helping me tomorrow morning. Could she do this with stimulants or drugs? She could, but I don't like it. There might be side factors, perhaps long-standing debilitation. It's a chance. A chance we will have to take. In less than seventy hours, this planet is due for destruction. In attempting to avert this tragedy, I'm expendable, as is everyone else here. Agreed? The doctor grunted deep in his beard and looked Brian's immense frame up and down. Agreed, he said almost happily. It is a distinct pleasure to see something beside black defeat around here. I'll go along with you. Well, you can help me right now. I checked the personnel roster and discovered that out of the twenty-eight people working here, there isn't a physical scientist of any kind other than yourself. A scruffy bunch of button-pushers and theoreticians. Not worth a damn for field work, the whole bunch of them. The doctor towed the floor switch on a waste receptacle and spat into it with feeling. Then I'm going to depend on you for some straight answers, Brian said. This is an unstandard operation, and the standard techniques just don't begin to make sense. Even poison distributions and Pareto extrapolations don't apply here. Stein nodded agreement, and Brian relaxed a bit. He had just relieved himself of his entire knowledge of sociatics, and it had sounded authentic. The more I look at it, the more I believe that this is a physical problem, something to do with the exotic and massive adjustments the Dissons have made to this hellish environment. Could this tie up in any way with their absolutely suicidal attitude towards the cobalt bombs? 
Could it? Could it? Dr. Stein paced the floor rapidly on his stocky legs, twining his fingers behind his back. You are bloody well right it could. Someone is thinking at last and not just punching bloody numbers into a machine and sitting and scratching his behind while waiting for the screen to light up with the answers. Do you know how Dissons exist? Brian shook his head. The fools here think it disgusting, but I call it fascinating. They have found ways to join a symbiotic relationship with the life forms on this planet, even a parasitic relationship. You must realize that living organisms will do anything to survive. Castaways at sea will drink their own urine in their need for water. Disgust at this is only the attitude of the overprotected who have never experienced extreme thirst or hunger. Well, here on Dis, you have a planet of castaways. Stein opened the door of the pharmacy. This talk of thirst makes me dry. With economically efficient motions, he poured grain alcohol into a beaker, thinned it with distilled water, and flavored it with some crystals from a bottle. He filled two glasses and handed Brian one. It didn't taste bad at all. What do you mean by parasitic, doctor? Aren't we all parasites of the lower life forms? Meat animals, vegetables and such? No, no, you missed the point. I speak of parasitic in the exact meaning of the word. You must realize that to a biologist there is no real difference between parasitism, symbiosis, mutualism, biontergasty, commensalism. Stop, stop. Brian said. Those are just meaningless sounds to me. If that is what makes this planet tick, I'm beginning to see why the rest of the staff has that lost feeling. It is just a matter of degree of the same thing. Look, you have a kind of crustacean living in the lakes here, very much like an ordinary crab. It has large claws in which it holds anemones, tentacle sea animals with no power of motion. The crustacean waves these around to gather food and eats the pieces they capture that are too big for them. This biontergasy, two creatures living and working together, yet each capable of existing alone. Now this same crustacean has a parasite living under its shell, a degenerated form of a snail that has lost all power of movement. A true parasite that takes its food from its host's body and gives nothing in return. Inside the snail's gut, there is a protozoan that lives off the snail's ingested food. Yet this little organism is not a parasite, as you might think at first, but a symbiote. It takes food from the snail, but at the same time it secretes a chemical that aids the snail's digestion of the food. Do you get the picture? All these life forms exist in a complicated interdependence. Brian frowned in concentration, sipping at the drink. It's making some kind of sense now. Symbiosis, parasitism, and all the rest are just ways of describing variations of the same basic process of living together. And there is probably a grading and shading between some of these that make the exact relationship hard to define. Precisely. Existence is so difficult on this world that the competing forms have almost died out. There are still a few left, preying off the others. It was the cooperating and interdependent life forms that really won out in the race for survival. I say life forms with intent. The creatures here are mostly a mixture of plant and animal, like the lichens you have elsewhere. The Dissons have a creature they called a Vede that they use for water when traveling. It has rudimentary powers of motion from its animal part, yet uses photosynthesis and stores water like a plant. When the Dissons drink from it, the thing taps their bloodstreams for food elements. I know, Brian said wryly. I drank from one. You can see my scars. I'm beginning to comprehend how the distance fit into the physical pattern of their world, and I realize it must have all kinds of psychological effects on them. Do you think this has any effect on their social organization? 
an important one but maybe i'm making too many suppositions now perhaps your researchers upstairs can tell you better after all this is their field brian had studied the reports on the social setup and not one word of them made sense they were a solid maze of unknown symbols and cryptic charts please continue doctor he insisted the societics reports are valueless so far there are factors missing you are the only one I have talked to so far that can give me any intelligent reports or answers. All right, then. Be it on your own head. The way I see it, you've got no society here at all, just a bunch of rugged individualists, each one for himself, getting nourishment from the other life forms of the planet. If they have a society, it is oriented toward the rest of the planetary life instead of towards other human beings. Perhaps that's why your figures don't make sense. They are set up for the human societies. In their relations with each other, these people are completely different. What about the Magter, the upper-class types who build castles and are causing all this trouble? I have no explanation, Dr. Stein admitted. My theories hold water and seem logical enough up to this point. But the Magter are the exception, and I have no idea why. They are completely different from the rest of the Dissons. Argumentative, bloodthirsty, looking for planetary conquest instead of peace. They aren't rulers, not in the real sense. They hold power because nobody else wants it. They grant mining concessions to off-worlders because they are the only ones with a sense of property. Maybe I'm going out on a limb, but if you can find out why they are so different, you may be on to the clue of our difficulties. For the first time since his arrival, Brian began to feel a touch of enthusiasm, plus a sense of the remote possibility that there might even be a solution to the deadly problem. He drained his glass and stood up. I hope you'll wake your patient early, doctor. You might be as interested in talking to her as I am. If what you told me is true, she could well be our key to the answer. She is Professor Leah Morris, and she is just out from Earth with degrees in exobiology and anthropology, and has a head stuffed with vital facts. Wonderful, Stein said. I shall take care of the head, not only because it is so pretty, but because of its knowledge. Though we totter on the edge of atomic destruction, I have a strange feeling of optimism for the first time since I landed on this planet. End of chapter 8「Nine of the Planet of the Damned » by Harry Harrison This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 the guard inside the front entrance of the foundation building jumped at the thunderous noise and reached for his gun he dropped his hand sheepishly when he realized it was only a sneeze though a gargantuan one brian came up sniffling huddling down into his coat i'm going out before i catch pneumonia he said the guard saluted dumbly and after checking his proximity detector screens he slipped out and the heavy portal thudded shut behind him the street was still warm from the heat of the day and he sighed happily and opened his coat this was partly a reconnaissance trip and partly a way of getting warmed up there was little else he could do in the building the staff had long since retired he had slept for a half an hour and had waked refreshed and ready to work all the reports he could understand had been read and reread until they were memorized he could use the time now while the rest of them were asleep to get better acquainted with the main city of dis as he walked the dark streets he realized how alien the disson way of life was to everything he knew this city hovestad literally meant main place in the native language and that's all it was it was only the presence of the off-worlders that made it into a city 
building after building standing deserted bore the names of mining companies traders space transporters none of them was occupied now some still had lights burning switched on by automatic apparatus others were as dark as the disan structures there weren't many of these native constructions and they seemed out of place among the rammed earth and prefab off-world buildings brian examined one that was dimly illuminated by the light on the corner of vegan smelters limited it consisted of a single large room resting right on the ground there were no windows and the whole thing appeared to have been constructed of some sort of woven material plastered with stone hard mud nothing was blocking the door and he was thinking seriously of going in when he became aware that he was being followed it was only a slight noise almost lost in the night normally it would never have been noticed but tonight brian was listening with his entire body someone was behind him swallowed up in the pools of darkness brian shrank back against the wall there was very little chance that this could be anyone but a disson he had a sudden memory of merv's severed head as it had been discovered outside the door Igel had helped him train his empathetic sense, and he reached out with it. It was difficult working in the dark. He could be sure of nothing. Was he getting a reaction or just wishing for one? Why did it have a ring of familiarity to it? A sudden idea struck him. Ulv, he said very softly, this is Brian. He crouched, ready for an attack. I know, a voice said softly in the night. Do not talk. Walk in the direction you were going before. Asking questions now would accomplish nothing. Brian turned instantly and did as he was bidden. The buildings grew further apart until he realized from the sand underfoot that he was back in the planet-wide desert. It could be a trap. He hadn't recognized the voice behind the whisper, yet he had to take this chance. A darker shape appeared in the dark night near him, and a burning hot hand touched his arm lightly. I will walk ahead. Follow close behind me. The words were louder, and this time Brian recognized the voice. Without waiting for an answer, Ulv turned, and his dimly seen shape vanished into the darkness. Brian moved swiftly after him until they walked side by side over the rolling hills of sand. The sand merged into hard-baked ground, became cracked and scarred with rock-filled gullies. They followed a deepening gully that grew into a good-sized ravine. When they turned an angle of the ravine, Brian saw a weak yellow light coming from an opening in the hard dirt wall. Ulv dropped on all fours and vanished through the shoulder-wide hole. Brian followed him, trying to ignore the growing tension and unease he felt. Crawling like this, head down, he was terribly vulnerable. He tried to shrug off the feeling, mentally blaming it on tense nerves. The tunnel was short and opened into a larger chamber. A sudden scuffle of feet sounded at the same instant that a wave of empathetic hatred struck him. It took vital seconds to fight his way out of the trapped tunnel, to roll clear and bring his gun up. During those seconds, he should have died. The disson poised above him had the short-handled stone hammer raised to strike a skull-crushing blow. Ulv was clutching the man's wrist, fighting silently to keep the hammer from falling. Neither combatant said a word, the rasp of their calloused feet on the sand the only sound. Brian backed away from the struggling men, his gun centered on the stranger. The disson followed him with burning eyes and dropped the hammer as soon as it was obvious the attack had failed. Why did you bring him here? he growled at Ulv. Why didn't you kill him? 
He is here so we can listen to what he says, Gebk. He is the one I told you of that I found in the desert. We listen to what he says and then we kill him, Gebk said with a mirthless grin. The remark wasn't meant to be humorous, but was made in all seriousness. Brian recognized this and knew that there was no danger for the present moment. He slid the gun away and for the first time looked around the chamber. It was domed in shape and was still hot from the heat of the day. Ulv took off the length of cloth he had wrapped around his body against the chill and refolded it as a kilt, strapping it on under his belt artifacts. He grunted something unintelligible, and when a muttered answer came, Brian for the first time became aware of the woman and the child. The two sat against the far wall, squatting on either side of a heap of fibrous plants. Both were nude, clothed only in the matted hair that fell below their shoulders. The belt of strange tools could not be classified as clothing. Even the child wore a tiny replica of his mother's. Putting down a length of plant she had been chewing, the woman shuffled over to the tiny fire that illuminated the room. A clay pot stood over it, and from this she ladled three bowls of food for the men. It smelled atrocious, and Brian tried not to taste or smell the sickening mixture while he ate it. He used his fingers, as did the other men, and did not talk while he ate. There was no way to tell if the silence was ritual or habit. It gave him a chance for a closer look at the distant way of living. The cave was obviously man-made. Tool marks could be clearly seen in the hard clay of the walls, except in the portion opposite the entrance. That was covered with a network of roots rising out of the floor and vanishing into the roof of earth above. Perhaps this was the reason for the cave's existence. The thin roots had been carefully twisted and plaited together until they formed a single swollen root in the center, as thick as a man's arm. From this hung four of the Vedas. Ulv had placed his there before he sat down. The teeth must have instantly sunk in, for it hung unsupported, another link in the distant life cycle. This appeared to be the source of the Vedas' water that nourished the people. Brian was aware of eyes upon him and turned and smiled at the little girl. She couldn't have been over six years old, but she was already a disson in every way. She neither returned his smile nor changed her expression, unchildlike in its stolidity. Her hands and jaw never stopped as she worked on the lengths of fibrous plant her mother had placed before her. The child split them with a small tool and removed a pod of some kind. This was peeled, partially by scraping with a different tool and partially by working between her teeth. It took long minutes to remove the tough rind. The results seemed hardly worth it. A tiny, wriggling object was finally disclosed, which the girl instantly swallowed. She then began working on the next pod. Ulf put down his clay bowl and belched. "'I brought you to the city as I told you I would,' he said. "'Have you done as you said you would?' "'What did he promise?' Gebk asked. "'That he would stop the war. Have you stopped it?' "'I am trying to stop it,' Brian said, "'but it is not that easy. I'll need some help. It is your life that needs saving, yours and your family's. If you would help me—' "'What is the truth? What is the truth?' Ulv broke in savagely. "'All I hear is difference, and there is no longer any way to tell truth. For as long as always we have done as the Magter said—' We bring them food, and they give us the metal and sometimes water when we need it. As long as we do as they ask, they do not kill us. They live the wrong way, but I have had bronze from them for my tools. They have told us that they are getting a world for us from the sky people, and that is good. 
It has always been known that the Sky People are evil in every way, and only good can come from killing them, Gebk said. Brian stared back at the two Dissons and their obvious hatred. Then why didn't you kill me, Ulv? he asked. That first time in the desert, or tonight when you stopped Grebk? I could have, but there was something more important. What is the truth? Can we believe as we have always done, or should we listen to this? He threw a small sheet of plastic to Brian, no bigger than the palm of his hand. A metal button was fastened to one corner of the wafer, and a simple drawing was embedded in the wafer. Brian held it to the light and saw the picture of a man's hand squeezing the button between thumb and forefinger. It was a sub-miniaturized playback. Mechanical pressure on the case provided enough current to play the recorded message. The plastic sheet vibrated, acting as a loudspeaker. Though the voice was thin and scratchy, the words were clearly audible. It was an appeal for the distant people not to listen to the Magter. It explained that the Magter had started a war that could have only one ending, the destruction of Dis. Only if the Magter were thrown down and their weapons discovered could there be any hope. Are these words true? Ulv asked. Yes, Brian said. They are perhaps true, Gebk said, but there is nothing that we can do. I was with my brother when these word things fell out of the sky, and he listened to one and took it to the Magter to ask them. They killed him, as he should have known they would do. The Magter kill us if they know we listen to the words. And the words tell us we will die if we listen to the Magter, Ulf shouted, his voice cracking, not with fear, but with frustration at the attempt to reconcile two opposite points of view. Up until this time his world had consisted of black and white values, with very few shadings of difference in between. There are things you can do that will stop the war without hurting yourselves or the Magter, Brian said, searching for a way to enlist their aid. Tell us, Ulv grunted. There would be no war if the Magter could be contacted, made to listen to reason. They are killing you all. You could tell me how to talk to the Magter, how I could understand them. No one can talk to the Magter, the woman broke in. If you say something different, they will kill you as they killed Greb's brother. So they are easy to understand. That is the way they are. They do not change. She put the length of plant she had been softening for the child back into her mouth. Her lips were deeply grooved and scarred from a lifetime of this work, her teeth at the sides worn almost to the bone. Mar is right, Ulv said. You do not talk to Magter. What else is there to do? Brian looked at the two men before he spoke and shifted his weight. The motion brought his fingertips just a few inches from his gun. The Magter have bombs that will destroy Nijord. This is the next planet, a star in your sky. If I can find where the bombs are, I will have them taken away and there will be no war. You want us to aid the devils in the sky against our own people? Grebk shouted, half rising. Ulv pulled him back to the ground, but there was no more warmth in his voice as he spoke. You are asking too much. You will leave now. Will you help me, though? Will you help stop the war? Brian asked, aware he had gone too far, but unable to stop. Their anger was making them forget the reasons for his being there. You ask too much, Ulf said again. Go back now. We will talk about it. Will I see you again? How can I reach you? We will find you if we wish to talk to you, was all Ulv said. If they decided he was lying, he would never see them again. There was nothing he could do about it. I have made up my mind, Grebk said, rising to his feet and drawing his cloth up until it covered his shoulders. 
You are lying, and this is all a lie of the Sky People. If I see you again, I will kill you. He stepped to the tunnel and was gone. There was nothing more to be said. Brian went out next, checking carefully to be sure that Yebk really had left, and Ulv guided him to the spot where the lights of Hovestad were visible. He did not speak during their return journey, and vanished without a word. Brian shivered in the night chill of the air, and wrapped his coat more tightly about him. Depressed, he walked back toward the warmer streets of the city. It was dawn when he reached the foundation building. A new guard was at the front entrance. No amount of hammering or threats could convince the man to open until Fossil came down, yawning and blinking with sleep. He was starting some complaint when Brian cut him off curtly and ordered him to finish dressing and report for work at once. Still feeling elated, Brian hurried into his office and cursed the overly efficient character who had turned on his air conditioner to chill the room again. When he turned it off this time, he removed enough vital parts to keep it out of order for the duration. When Fossil came in, he was still yawning behind his fist, obviously a low morning sugar type. Before you fall on your face, go out and get some coffee, Brian said. Two cups. I'll have a cup, too. That won't be necessary, Fossil said, drawing himself up stiffly. I'll call the canteen if you wish some. He said it in the iciest tone he could manage this early in the morning. In his enthusiasm, Brian had forgotten the hate campaign he had directed against himself. Suit yourself, he said shortly, getting back into the role. But the next time you yawn, there will be a negative entry in your service record. If that's clear, you can brief me on this organization's visible relations with the Dissons. How do they take us? Fossil choked and swallowed a yawn. I believe they look on the CRF people as some species of simpleton, sir. They hate all off-worlders. Memory of their desertion has been passed on verbally for generations. So by their one-to-one -one logic, we should either hate back or go away. We stay instead, and we give them food, water, medicine, and artifacts. Because of this, they let us remain on sufferance. I imagine they consider us do-gooder idiots, and as long as we cause no trouble, they'll let us stay. He shrugged miserably to suppress a yawn, so Brian turned his back and gave him a chance to get it out. What about the Nigerders? How much do they know of our work? Brian looked out the window at dusty buildings, outlined in purple against the violent colors of the desert sunrise. Nijord is a cooperating planet and has full knowledge at all executive levels. They are giving us all the aid they can. Well, now is the time to ask for more. Can I contact the commander of the blockading fleet? There is a scrambler connection right through to him. I'll set it up. Fossil bent over the desk and punched a number into the phone controls. The screen flowed with the black and white patterns of the scrambler. That's all, Fossil, Brian said. I want privacy for this talk. What's the commander's name? Professor Kraft. He's a physicist. They have no military men at all, so they called him in for the construction of the bombs and energy weapons. He's still in charge. Fossil yawned extravagantly as he went out the door. The professor commander was very old, with wispy gray hair and a network of wrinkles surrounding his eyes. His image shimmered, then cleared as the scrambler units aligned. "'You must be Brian Brand,' he said. "'I have to tell you how sorry we all are that your friend Igel and the two others had to die after coming so far to help us.' I'm sure you are very happy to have had a friend like that. Why, yes, of course, Brian said, reaching for the scattered fragments of his thought processes. It took an effort to remember the first conflict, now that he was worrying about the death of a planet. It's very kind of you to mention it, but I would like to find out a few things from you, if I could. Anything at all, we are at your disposal. Before we begin, though, I shall pass on the thanks of our council for your aid in joining us. 
even if we are eventually forced to drop the bombs we shall never forget that your organization did everything possible to avert the disaster once again brian was caught off balance for an instant he wondered if Kraft was being insincere then recognized the baseness of this thought the completeness of the man's humanity was obvious and compelling the thought passed through brian's mind that now he had an additional reason for wanting the war ended without destruction on either side he very much wanted to visit Nijord to see these people on their home grounds. Professor Kraft waited patiently and silently while Brian pulled his thoughts together and answered. I still hope that this thing can be stopped in time. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. I want to see Lig Magti, and I thought it would be better if I had a legitimate reason. Are you in contact with him? Kraft shook his head. No, not really in contact. When this trouble started, I sent him a transceiver so we could talk directly, but he has delivered his ultimatum speaking for the Magter. The only terms he will hear are unconditional surrender. His receiver is on, but he has said that it is the only message he will answer. Not much chance of him ever being told that, Brian said. There was, at one time. I hope you realize, Brian, that the decision to bomb Dis was not easily arrived at. A great many people, myself included, voted for unconditional surrender. We lost the vote by a very small margin. Brian was getting used to these philosophical body blows, and he rolled with the punches now. Are there any of your people left on this planet, or do you have any troops I can call on for help? This is still a remote possibility. But if I do find out where the bombs or the launchers are, a surprise raid would knock them out. We have no people left in Hovestad now. All the ones who weren't evacuated were killed. But there are commando teams standing by here to make a landing if the weapons are detected. The Dissons must depend on secrecy to protect their armament, since we have both the manpower and the technology to reach any objective. We also have technicians and other volunteers looking for the weapon sites. They have not been successful as yet, and most of them were killed soon after landing. Kraft hesitated for a moment. There is another group you should know about. You will need all the factors. Some of our people are in the desert outside of Hovestad. We do not officially approve of them, though they have a good deal of popular support. They are mostly young men, operating as raiders, killing and destroying with very little compunction. They are attempting to uncover the weapons by sheer strength of arms. This was the best news yet. Brian controlled his voice and kept his expression calm when he spoke. I don't know how far I can stretch your cooperation, but could you possibly tell me how to get in touch with him? Kraft allowed himself a small smile. I'll give you the wavelength on which you can reach their radio. They call themselves the Nijord Army. When you talk to them, you can do me a favor. Pass on a message. Just to prove things aren't bad enough, they've become a little worse. One of our technical crews has detected jump space energy transmissions in the planetary crust. The Dissons are apparently testing their projector sooner than we had estimated. Our deadline has been revised by one day. I'm afraid there are only two days left before you must evacuate. His eyes were large with compassion. I'm sorry. I know this will make your job that much harder. Brian didn't want to think about the loss of a full day from his already close deadline. Have you told the Dissons this yet? No, Kraft told him. The decision was reached a few minutes before your call. It is going on the radio to Lig Magte now. Can you cancel the transmission and let me take the message in person? I can do that, Kraft thought for a moment. But it would surely mean your death at their hands. They have no hesitation in killing any of our people. I would prefer to send it by radio. If you do that, 
you will be interfering with my plans and perhaps destroying them under the guise of saving my life isn't my life my own to dispose of as i will for the first time professor Kraft was upset i'm sorry terribly sorry i'm letting my concern and worry wash over into my public affairs of course you may do as you please i could never think of stopping you he turned and said something inaudible off-screen the call is cancelled the responsibility is yours all our wishes for success go with you end of transmission end of transmission brian said and the screen went dark fossil he shouted into the intercom get me the best and fastest sand car we have a driver who knows his way around and two men who can handle a gun and know how to take orders we're gonna get some positive action at last end of chapter nine chapter ten of planet of the damned by harry harrison this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten it's suicide the taller guard grumbled mine not yours so don't worry about it brian barked at him your job is to remember your orders and keep them straight now let's hear them again the guard rolled his eyes up in silent rebellion and repeated in a toneless voice we stay here in the car and keep the motor running while you go inside the stone pile there we don't let anybody in the car and we try to keep them clear of the car short of shooting them that is we don't come in no matter what happens or what it looks like but wait for you here unless you call on the radio in which case we come in with the automatics going and shoot the place up and it doesn't matter who we hit this will be done only as a last resort see if you can arrange that last resort thing the other guard said patting the heavy blue barrel of his weapon i meant that last resort brian said angrily if any guns go off without my permission you will pay for it and pay with your necks I want that clearly understood you are here as a rear guard and as a base for me to get back to this is my operation and mine alone unless I call you in understood he waited until all three men had nodded in agreement then checked the charge on his gun it was fully loaded it would be foolish to go in unarmed but he had to one gun wouldn't save him he put it aside the button radio on his collar was working and had a strong enough signal to get through any number of walls he took off his coat threw open the door and stepped out into the searing brilliance of the dissin noon there was only the desert silence broken by the steady throb of the car's motor behind him stretching away to the horizon in every direction was the eternal desert of sand the keep stood nearby solitary a massive pile of black rock brian plodded closer watching for any motion from within the walls nothing stirred the high-walled irregularly shaped construction sat in a ponderous silence brian was sweating now only partially from the heat he circled the thing looking for a gate there wasn't one at ground level a slanting cleft in the stone could be climbed easily but it seemed incredible that this might be the only entrance a complete circuit proved that it was brian looked unhappily at the slanting and broken ramp then cupped his hands and shouted loudly i'm coming up your radio doesn't work any more i'm bringing the message from nijord that you have been waiting to hear this was a slight bending of the truth without fracturing it there was no answer just the hiss of wind-blown sand against the rock and the mutter of the car in the background he started to climb the rock underfoot was crumbling and he had to watch where he put his feet at the same time he fought a constant impulse to look up 
watching for anything falling from above. Nothing happened. When he reached the top of the wall, he was breathing hard, sweat moistening his body. There was still no one in sight. He stood on an unevenly shaped wall that appeared to circle the building. Instead of having a courtyard inside it, the wall was the outer face of the structure, the domed roof rising from it. At varying intervals, dark openings gave access to the interior. When Brian looked down, the sand car was just a dun-colored bump in the desert, already far behind him. Stooping, he went through the nearest door. There was still no one in sight. The room inside was something out of a madman's funhouse. It was higher than it was wide, irregular in shape, and more like a hallway than a room. At one end it merged into an incline that became a stairwell. At the other end, in a hole that vanished in darkness below. Light of sorts filtered in through slots and holes drilled into the thick stone wall. Everything was built of the same crumbled, textured, but strong rock. Brian took the stairs. After a number of blind passages and wrong turns, he saw a stronger light ahead and went on. There was food, metal, even artifacts of the unusual Disson design in the different rooms he passed through, yet no people. The light ahead grew stronger, and the last passageway opened and swelled out until it led into the large central chamber. This was the heart of the strange structure. All the rooms, passageways, and halls existed just to give form to this gigantic chamber. The walls rose sharply, the room being circular in cross-section and growing narrower towards the top. It was a truncated cone, since there was no ceiling. A hot blue disk of sky cast light on the floor below. On the floor stood a knot of men who stared at Brian. Out of the corner of his eyes, and with the very periphery of his consciousness, he was aware of the rest of the room, barrels, stores, machinery, a radio transceiver, various bundles and heaps that made no sense at first glance. There was no time to look closer. Every fraction of his attention was focused on the muffled and hooded men. He had found the enemy. Everything that had happened to him so far on Dis had been a preparation for this moment. The attack in the desert, the escape, the dreadful heat of the sun and sand, all this had tempered and prepared him. It had been nothing in itself. Now the battle would begin in earnest. None of this was conscious in his mind. His fighter's reflexes bent his shoulders, curved his hands before him as he walked softly in balance, ready to spring in any direction. Yet none of this was really necessary. All the danger so far was non-physical. When he did give conscious thought to the situation, he stopped, startled. What was wrong here? None of the men had moved or made a sound. How could he even know they were men? They were so muffled and wrapped in cloth that only their eyes were exposed. No doubt, however, existed in Brian's mind. In spite of muffled cloth and silence, he knew them for what they were. The eyes were empty of expression and unmoving, yet were filled with the same negative emptiness as those of a bird of prey. They could look on life, death, and the rending of flesh with the same lack of interest and compassion. All this Brian knew in an instant of time, without words being spoken. Between the time he lifted one foot and walked a step, he understood what he had to face. There could be no doubt, not to an empathetic. From the group of silent men poured a frost-white wave of unemotion. An empathetic shares what other men feel. He gets his knowledge of their reaction by sensing lightly their emotions, the surges of interest, hate, love, 
fear desire the sweep of large and small sensations that accompany all thought and action the empathetic is always aware of this constant and silent surge whether he makes the effort to understand it or not he is like a man glancing across the open pages of a table full of books he can see that the type words paragraph thoughts are there even without focusing his attention to understand any of it then how does the man feel when he glances at the open books and sees only blank pages the books are there the words are not he turns the pages of one of the others flipping the pages searching for meaning there is no meaning all the pages are blank this was the way in which the magter were blank without emotions there was a barely sensed surge and return that must have been neural impulses on a basic level the automatic adjustments of nerve and muscle that keep an organism alive nothing more brian reached for other sensations but there was nothing there to grasp either these men were without emotions or they were able to block them from his detection it was impossible to tell which very little time had passed while brian made these discoveries the knot of men still looked at him silent and unmoving they weren't expectant their attitude could not have been called one of interest but he had come to them and now they waited to find out why any questions or statements they spoke would be superfluous so they didn't speak the responsibility was his i have come to talk with lig magte who is he brian didn't like the tiny noise his voice made in the immense room one of the men gave a slight motion to draw attention to himself none of the others moved they still waited i have a message for you brian said speaking slowly to fill the silence of the room and the emptiness of his thoughts this had to be handled right but what was right i'm from the foundation in the city as you undoubtedly know i've been talking to the people of nijord they have a message for you the silence grew longer brian had no intention of making this a monologue he needed facts to operate to form an opinion looking at the silent forms was telling him nothing time stretched taut and finally lig magti spoke the nijorders are going to surrender it was an impossibly strange sentence brian had never realized before how much of the content of speech was made up of emotion if the man had given it a positive emphasis perhaps said it with enthusiasm it would have meant success the enemy is going to surrender this wasn't the meaning with a rising inflection on the end it would have been a question are they going to surrender it was neither of these the sentence carried no other message than that contained in the simplest meanings of the separate words it had intellectual connotations but these could only be gained from past knowledge not from the sound of the words there was only one message they were prepared to receive from nijord therefore brian was bringing the message if that was not the message brian was bringing the men here were not interested this was the vital fact if they were not interested he could have no further value to them since he came from the enemy he was the enemy therefore he would be killed because this was vital to his existence brian took the time to follow the thought through it made logical sense and logic was all he could depend on now he could be talking to robots or alien creatures for all the human response he was receiving you can't win this war all you can do is hurry your own deaths he said this with as much conviction as he could realizing at the same time that it was wasted effort 
no flicker of response stirred in the men before him the Nigerders know you have the cobalt bombs and they have detected your jump space projector they can't take any more chances they have pushed the deadline closer by an entire day there are one and a half days left before the bombs fall and you are all destroyed do you realize what that means is that the message lig magte asked yes brian said two things saved his life then he had guessed what would happen as soon as they had his message though he hadn't been sure but even the suspicion had put him on his guard this combined with the reflexes of a winner of the twenties was barely enough to enable him to survive from frozen immobility lig Magti had catapulted into headlong attack as he leaped forward he drew a curved double-edged blade from under his robes it plunged unerringly through the spot where brian's body had been an instant before there had been no time to tense his muscles and jump just the space of time to relax them and fall to one side his reasoning mind joined the battle as he hit the floor lig magti plunged by him turning and bringing the knife down at the same time brian's foot lashed out and caught the other man's leg sending him sprawling they were both on their feet at the same instant facing each other brian now had his hands clasped before him in the unarmed man's best defense against a knife the two arms protecting the body the two hands joined to beat aside the knife arm from whichever direction it came the disson hunched low flipped the knife quickly from hand to hand then thrust it again at brian's midriff only by the merest fractional margin did brian evade the attack for the second time lig magte fought with utter violence every action was as intense as possible deadly and thorough there could be only one end to this unequal contest if brian stayed on the defensive the man with the knife had to win with the next charge brian changed tactics he leaped inside the thrust clutching the knife arm a burning slice of pain cut across his arm then his fingers clutched the tendoned wrist they clamped down hard grinding shut compressing with the tightening intensity of a closing vice it was all he could do simply to hold on there was no science in it just his greater strength from exercise and existence on a heavier planet all of this strength went to his clutching hand because he held his own life in that hand forcing away the knife that wanted to terminate it forever nothing else mattered neither the frightening force of the knees that thudded into his body nor the hooked fingers that reached for his eyes to tear them out he protected his face as well as he could while the nails tore furrows through his flesh and the cut on his arm bled freely these were only minor things to be endured his life depended on the grasp of the fingers of his right hand there was a sudden immobility as brian succeeded in clutching lig magte's other arm it was a good grip and he could hold the arm immobilized they had reached stasis standing knee to knee their faces only a few inches apart the muffling cloth had fallen from the disson's face during the struggle and empty frigid eyes stared into brian's no flicker of emotion crossed the harsh planes of the other man's face a great puckered white scar covered one cheek and pulled up a corner of the mouth in a cheerless grimace it was false there was still no expression here even when the pain must be growing more intense brian was winning if none of the watchers broke the impasse his greater weight and strength counted now the disson would have to drop the knife before his arm was dislocated at the shoulder he didn't do it with sudden horror brian realized that he wasn't going to drop it no matter what happened a dull hideous snap jerked through the disson's body and the arm hung limp and dead no expression crossed the man's face the knife was still locked in the fingers of the paralyzed hand 
With his other hand, Lig Magte reached across and started to pry the blade loose, ready to continue the battle one-handed. Brian raised his foot and kicked the knife free, sending it spinning across the room. Lig Magte made a fist of his good hand and crashed it into Brian's groin. He was still fighting as if nothing had changed. Brian backed slowly away from the man. Stop it, he said. You can't win now. It's impossible. He called to the other men who were watching the unequal battle with expressionless immobility. No one answered him. With a terrible, sinking sensation, Brian then realized what would happen and what he had to do. Lig Magti was as heedless of his own life as he was of the life of his planet. He would press the attack no matter what damage was done to him. Brian had an insane vision of him breaking the man's other arm, fracturing both his legs, and the limbless broken creature still coming forward, crawling, rolling, teeth bared, since they were the only remaining weapon. There was only one way to end it. Brian fainted, and the Lig Magte's arm moved clear of his body. The engulfing cloth was thin, and through it, Brian could see the outlines of the Disson's abdomen and ribcage, the clear location of the great nerve ganglion. It was the death blow of karate. Brian had never used it on a man. In practice he had broken heavy boards, splintering them instantly with the short, precise stroke. The stiffened hand, moving forward in a sudden surge, all the weight and energy of his body concentrated in his joined fingertips plunging deep into the other's flesh. Killing not by accident or in sudden anger, killing because this was the only way the battle could possibly end. Like a ruined tower of flesh, the Disson crumpled and fell. Dripping blood, exhausted, Brian stood over the body of Lig Magti and stared at the dead man's allies. Death filled the room. End of chapter 10